There we go. This quote on the front of our report came from the WHO Regional Office for Africa. And it makes the point that we expect medicines to be of good standard, but there are significant concerns about not only counterfeit, but substandard medicines worldwide. And I want to present what I hope was a, an objective statement. Africa, of course, very vulnerable in that it has weak pharmaceutical interests, poor people, and you would expect to find problems of medicine supply, not just in terms of quality, but also affordability in, for example, sub-Saharan African nations. I think my job here today is to say there is a real challenge of counterfeit medicines defined as deliberately falsified, the conscious intent to receive, uh, to, to deceive, and also to produce in circumstances which aren't legally regulated. Even if a medicine happens to be of acceptable quality, if it's produced in unregulated circumstances, it's inherently at risk of having faults, not being recallable, etc. But I think it's also my job to be saying, let's be careful, let's not exaggerate. Many more people, orders of magnitude more people, suffer and die in this world because of lack of access to affordable health care lack of access to the professionals who are necessary often to use medicines to good effect. We shouldn't lose sight of that. There are all sorts of vested interests which surround the issue of counterfeiting, and we should be sensibly aware of them, aware of all our own um, interests. With that in mind, I'm very <coughs> grateful to IFPMA for funding uh, the research in this report. Um, I received a, a fee personally, of, or will receive, I hope, a fee, um, a, a little over a thousand pounds. I hope I'm not corrupted, but be careful of people who believe they're not corrupted. Um, corruption is not something much more insidious than sometimes simply believing you'd be bribed to do something. I hope I haven't. Um, the point there to emphasize is most medicines produced not in those circumstances are deliberate deception, are of good quality, some are of poor quality. The normal regulatory activity you need to control that is different from the sort of criminal sanction you may take in the context of counterfeiting. There is obviously, as many of you in the audience will know, many of you here with us will know, there's been confusion, doubt, concern about has the, the debate about counterfeiting been used as a means of undermining the legitimate generic market? Has it been a cover for the Western countries' interests, I believe entirely legitimate, in intellectual property protection? The message here today is I think if we're going to get this issue of falsified medicines correct, we have to separate it out and be very clear we're simply talking about that alone and leave these other issues for debate in the proper forum and for the proper action. The two individuals there, Paul Newton at the top, did pioneering research in Africa and Southeast Asia on malaria medicines, a very well respected UK academic. Um, his figures in the past of the ones that I've been basing my uh, estimates that anti-malarial drugs may be in poorer areas, 20% counterfeit, perhaps higher. Roger um, Bate, uh, produced this book called Fake. Roger um, doesn't quite have my cautions about exaggeration. Nevertheless, he's got some very good evidence in here. Have we got qualitative evidence of a problem of genuine counterfeiting? Yes, I think we do have. What we need is the mature political debate now to go with that, to say, right, how do we get proper solutions in place as part of our overall approach to world health, to affordable health care, to good quality medicines, and to the elimination of pharmaceutical crime as and when it occurs. And that's the message really in essence of, of this document. So that's a, a diagram from it, um, simply to make the point that there are various ways you could think of it as having two streams, the legitimate um, regulated medicines production stream at the top and the illicit supply stream at the bottom. Now you can, you can get mistakes <coughs> entering um, that, 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 those supply chains at various points. 
for example, the supply of the active pharmaceutical ingredient. It may be sometimes that a legitimate but incompetent manufacturer buys the wrong excipient. You remember that the FDA in 1938 was strengthened because of a tragedy involving early antibiotics and the use of diethylene glycol as a, as a solvent, which is an antifreeze and happens to be, it makes things taste all right, but it's toxic. So about 100 people died in the States in the late 1930s. That led to a strengthening of the FDA. Now we've seen similar events in China. We've seen similar events recently in Nigeria. Whether they should be classified as counterfeit, I think they probably shouldn't in those cases. I think when I looked at them, this was mistaken supply and the use of a wrong solvent. Um, but they certainly led, so they sometimes been reported as counterfeiting, um, and they certainly led to interest in, in strengthening regulation of quality of production. Similarly, there was a case in the state of heparin, which was said by some to be counterfeit, which involved the use of a poor quality ingredient from China. I won't go into the details. Whether that's properly regarded as counterfeiting or whether it was, um, in one way or another, lack of quality control over a whole production chain is a matter for debate. Um, but again, there is the possibility of confusions here. Are we talking about pharmaceutical crime? Are we talking about poor quality? There are sometimes gray areas. Another point just to make about that diagram is that, of course, stuff can leak back from the illegitimate supply chain into the legitimate one. Sometimes returns, and I'll talk in a couple of minutes about a particular case in the UK where somebody who was involved in criminal activity managed to insert drugs, so-called parallel imports, medicines trade across UK boundaries, uh, European boundaries, as legitimate um, drugs to a legitimate wholesaler stroke repackager who identified them and reported them to, to the police. So you can get the facts there. A big vulnerability in the Western world, of course, is the supply of, of poor quality and or counterfeit falsified medicines by the internet. That, I think, in the report is an area, and I know colleagues at IFPMA have separately identified an area where we, we, we may need to look further. I should emphasize that we have full editorial control, myself and Dr. Osman Khan of Matrix, in the preparation of the report, and any errors in it, any misjudgment, and nothing to do with IFPMA. We really did have academic freedom. The result of the danger of that, of course, is remember who academics are. But um, thank you to IFPMA for their forbearance and putting up with my insistence that this is really something we will not to exaggerate. This again is another diagram from the board, just doing an outline map of stakeholders. The point I wanted to raise there is, of course, that over the last 60, 70 years, we've had a pharmaceutical revolution, which has changed the face of medicine for many common diseases, whether infections, whether the NCDs. We, are, we either have good treatments available or the means of alleviating distress in a way that was not available to humankind for the rest of the 220, 30,000 years that Homo sap has been on the planet. Fantastic achievement. Initially, of course, introduced as patented medicines and now available as generics. There is a difference in the interests of the industry which wants to go on innovating. And I think that's deeply in the human interest. If we stand still on the biological sciences, what we know is we're dead in the 21st century. And the industry which perfectly legitimately wants to produce low-cost medicines once they've lost into the property protection. The retentions there which also are reflected between the, the interests of governments. We as global citizens need to see that there, um, of course, there are differences in European, US interests compared to, say, countries like Brazil, China, India. Those are legitimate and sensible. They're part of the human development story. There are also, of course, big differences between the interests of populations and governments in Africa, which don't have a significant stake in either industry, at least at present. And we need to respect those. So sometimes we shouldn't undermine the little the debate about areas like counterfeiting, falsification, substandard medicines, as simply something to do with just a squabble between companies or research-based companies versus generic. There are global, national concerns, international concerns, which we need to understand if we're to take a mature interest in this area, 
and resolve conflict because otherwise we don't maximize health. We may, just by taking the issue of counterfeiting not seriously enough, cause the unnecessary deaths of significant numbers of people unless we rise above petty squabbling. So in the report, we focus on the fact that the quantitative evidence available about the harm caused by counterfeiting and allied phenomena, I won't go into the complex definitions, it feels round definition. Um, the quantitative evidence is weak. WHO started taking a formal interest in this area in the mid 80s, and it was with the wisdom of retrospect, which is also a great instrument, of course. Um, perhaps more should have been invested then in um, understanding the scale of harm accurately. The opportunity now is to make that investment, and I think it's happening. I think some of the debate of the last five to ten years has really enabled us to get a focus on the need to get good information. And so I congratulate those who are, are now taking part in that. The examples we gave illustratively, Kevin Zhu, for example, was a, 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 a Chinese businessman, is a Chinese businessman, who produced drugs in a number of, of areas, um, treatment of prostate cancer, plastics for cardiovascular disease, um, major tranquilizers, medicines to treat psychotic illness. Um, managed to export them to various places in the world. In, in the UK, he had a, uh, an accomplice called Gillespie who falsified um, paperwork, managed to import these drugs and insert them in the supply chain as, as parallel traded drugs. Christian Winkle, I think was at one stage, I don't know, but I believe it was employed by UCL. He set up a, a manufacturing plant in London, was, was caught very early on, but attempted to uh, manufacture erectile dysfunction drugs. Now that's a special area of interest in counterfeiting because that's a lifestyle drug with a, a special interest. But of course it deserves just the attention that any other area of treatment deserves. Um, and there have been deaths across the world, for example in Southeast Asia, associated with adulterated um, copies of, of erectile dysfunction treatments. There's the ongoing case of falsified Avastin and Tamiflu in the US. The Tamiflu cases we exemplified were, were internet purchased. The Avastin appeared to be a, a, a concerted attempt to in, inject something of high, high, very high cost relatively into the supply chain. Um, I think the details of that aren't worked out yet, but it gives an example that if things can enter the US supply chain, which is probably the best guarded in the world, then we're all vulnerable to a degree, although again, one shouldn't exaggerate the risk to individuals. Um, further examples in free trade zone, in countries like the Lebanon, how did the, the Council of Europe get involved in looking at counterfeiting? Of course, the concern about the Balkans conflicts, where you get conflict, you get people exposed, you get opportunity for trading of all sorts of things and all sorts of items which shouldn't necessarily be traded. Um, the example we gave in Nigeria is a rather sad example of a small trader involved in a local corrupt dealing with a small company locally. These things can be large scale, but by and large, they're, they're often, when you look at them individually, rather sad cases which reflect the poverty of the environment in which they occurred. Uh, Harper Cash, Kyle there, she, she's actually a PhD in chemistry. She's just done a large study. She works at one school of hygiene. She reported a case of a Spanish tourist nearly dying of malaria in the Lancet this autumn uh, because they were using fake anti-malarials. Uh, she's also done very large scale work in Africa about the scale of the problem. And what she's found on, on with our test units is that um, by and large, the, the supply appears to be she wasn't checking for counterfeiting in the strict legal sense of the term. She was checking what were active ingredients in the drugs. She found at very high levels that the work is the active ingredient of the drugs. So her interpre interpretation of that data is, is still yet to be fully published, so I can't go further, but is that things appear to be getting better. But the, the debate over the last 10 years has led to improvement in, in supply in Africa and Asia. So we shouldn't be unduly negative. Um, the examples we give from Nigeria to, to Russia to Turkey 
are of regulatory agencies working to drive up standards to take cooperate with the police to investigate clear areas of criminal activity. Um, the woman there to the right, um, Dr. Akunyili, Dora Akunyili from Nigeria, she headed Nigeria's NAFTAC in the early part of this, this um, century, the early five years. A uh, fantastic, energetic woman. I had the honor and pleasure of organizing a meeting with her in the House of Commons about 10 years ago about counterfeiting. My God, she filled the place with energy. Um, her, her sister actually died before she started out. She's got a PhD in pharmacy. Um, her sister died of fake insulin, but insulin with no active ingredient in it. Mm. So she knew the truth of this. She was shot at. Um, one of her assistants was one stage uh, in trying to clear up a Nigerian market was beheaded. So there are real uh, dangers here. But is the evidence even in Nigeria that things are improving? Yes, there is. I've had a PhD student looking, for example, at diabetes treatments. And again, nearly all the treatments she found weren't counterfeit, did have an active ingredient, although some had in, uh, inadequate quantities in there. Um, in Europe, we've got the 2011 falsified medicine directive. We're putting in place further defences, which again exaggerate the idea that everybody in, risk in Europe is at risk is a pernicious idea. Um, we're relatively well defended, but at the same time, precautionary and sensible control activity is still needed. The gentleman there, Tom Hook, who Luke used to work with, Tom sadly died about six months ago. He was involved in the work of IMPACT, the WHO initiative, which um, was launched in around 2005-06, um, about which there's been a degree of controversy. Now, I mentioned Tom partly to honour his contributions to pharmacy, partly to say he's an example of somebody who's involved in IMPACT, who I've got no doubt about the integrity of his motivation, absolutely not. There was, however, concern which built up about is this body going too far into the areas of intellectual property protection, maybe even endangering legitimate generic supply, and the challenge for the world is affordable medicines to poor people, one of the key challenges for the world over the next decade or two. I, as I say, I have no doubt of the good intentions of those involved. It's probably best, though, now that we accept moving on and focus on creating a new mechanism, which is free from those debates, um, and focuses on the substantive public interest issues associated with pharmaceutical crime. So in the paper, I'm sorry if you don't try to read the, the bit on the right, but it's, it's our attempt to build a, a model of what you might try to achieve following that Buenos Aires meeting, where, um, as it says there, 200 delegates, 76 countries involved. What sort of new mechanism should we create? Well, first of all, I think all member states of WHO should be assured that whatever mechanism is there is probably accountable to the assembly. There's, there's proper democratic and national control. The opportunity at, at the central level, I think, is to address that, that issue of quantification, scale of harm, nature of harm, causes of harm, and to establish agreed global strategic priorities. At, at regional level, WHO, regional level, um, again, the opportunities for collaboration between regulatory authorities to focus out what specifically are South America's interests, what specifically are Southeast Asia's interests, and to apply global strategy locally and to try and stimulate awareness. All the things that IMPACT was trying to do, to try to develop local expertise, um, make sure the facilities in place for, for staff training, the exchanging experience between nations. And then, of course, at national level, you want the capacity to implement. Um, you certainly want to be involved with customs organisations, police organisations, healthcare organisations, professional groups, industry is appropriate, at all levels in there, to share knowledge and keep that commitment to the public interest issues and to be precise. Um, I sometimes think academic rigor most mortis when people say academic rigor. What we need is objectivity and close attention to the facts and evidence where we can get it. 
And where we haven't got it, we need to be very precise that it, there isn't evidence there. If the new WHO mechanism doesn't evolve um, appropriately and effectively, in Europe, for example, we've, we've got, you can't read that at all, but there are other potential mechanisms through the Council of Europe. Um, they may have disadvantages, they may have strengths. There are other potential way forwards, but for me, the priority here is to try and get people working together solidly behind WHO with its interests in world health to take the area forward. I hope this report, I've written things all my life and I realise very few ever get read apart from possibly the headlines. Um, I hope that it contributes to thinking and that generation of goodwill that ultimately we need to resolve any conflicts between going forward with innovation, producing the technologies this world needs to survive on the one hand, with making sure we get access to those innovations on the other, amongst those most in need. And beyond that, I have a pattern of global development, which of course accepts the historic interests of what we are pleased to call developed areas like Europe, need to be reconciled with those of emergent areas of Africa, Asia, Latin America. So that's where I think I'll, I'll leave it and hand over to colleagues. If people want to have further debate about this area, that's my email address, and I'd be only too pleased to, given the limitations of time on all our parts, to, to have correspondence. Thank you.